good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to our eighth lesson, eighth installment, Beyond the Seven, live from Jerusalem with Rabbi Aaron David Poston. He's spending some deep time teaching us some wonderful, wonderful things that are all universal that actually go beyond the seven. I'm enjoying this class. He's uh, teaching us so much. So let's just jump right in, see how the rabbi's doing tonight. Rabbi Poston, so good to see you. I know we keep you up late, but you know what? It's joy to hear Torah, and thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Dan, for having me once again. And hello, shalom to all of the audience live and uh, whoever's watching this afterwards. So uh, thank you for joining us. And thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, you're teaching us some wonderful things out of Torah. You know, a few things that get me thinking during the week. That's good. We have to think. We have to always be thinking. So uh, the first thing I want to start with was a little message about uh, race. I know that's a hot topic these days, and uh, I'll keep it uh, Torah-oriented because, um, look, this is the uh, Noahide World Center, and um, everybody from all over the world, all different uh, creeds, race, religions are tuning in. And I want them to know what the Torah actually says about race. Judaism is not a race, and um, it recognizes that there are races. There are 70 nations and different colors and different shapes and forms of human beings. We're all created in the image of God. This is uh, what Judaism has taught the world. And um, back to the beginning, you know, back in Genesis, you know, Adam, the first man, Adam, I, I, I pronounce the D like a T. Uh, Adam, Adam, not Adam, but so he was created, he was formed, not far from where I'm sitting right now, and Hashem, the Almighty, the creator of the universe, took soil from the entire globe, little bits and pieces from different, um, from the different continents, from different uh, places in the world where nations would eventually reside, and he took that soil and he formed man. Now, it's true that the entire body was made from this soil, and the soil that was used specifically for the head was taken from the Temple Mount. So he was created on the Temple Mount from soil that came from all, I, we use this term, the four corners of the globe. We know that the globe is round, but we use the word corners. I hope everyone forgives me for my, uh, my lack of uh, better, better terminology. So... In, in reality, we, whoever we are, every human being, is multi, because I have, I have, like you have, soil that originally came from the entire globe. Now, when man was dispersed and then lived in the different countries, there's vibrations, there's energy that's coming from that place. And that is what, and I'm not talking about evolution, okay? It may sound like I'm talking about evolution, but I'm not that there are the spiritual vibrations, the physical, it's called metaphysical aspects of living in a certain um, Area. temperate locale, a locale uh, whether it's the sun, whether it's the soil, the combination thereof affects the skin, affects the way the, sh the face is formed, <clears throat> the way the different aspects of the body uh, reacts to that soil. And my proof that I've given is that when Jews have been dispersed themselves, they begin to look like, after many generations, like the local, the, the local people, the natives of wherever they're at. Now, it is true that there are converts who then join in, and that would help, uh, let's say, enlarge the gene pool, uh, create um, local, you know, the Jews looking more like the local people. But even those communities without converts, who people had not converted, were not intermarried, okay, in, meaning intermarried after a conversion, that those Jews began to look like the people of the locale. The question is why? Why does that happen? Okay, so I don't want to I don't want to spend too much time, but I just wanted to speak about this because I think it's an important topic that we all have to look at each other as a brother, okay, no matter what color or whatever, you know, different aspects you have, um, you know, in your face, or body that we're mom, we're really our brothers, and um, this is the message. The Jew, the Jew has this responsibility to teach the world how to love each other. Right? 
I, I mentioned this in previous uh, sessions that we're all supposed to teach each other to, to, we're supposed to teach the world how to treat your brother. So we have obligations specifically towards Jews and hopefully the whole world will pick it up and treat each other. So one of the um, source materials that we use for this idea is by Yaakov when he was told by Lavan in a negotiation what he could keep in terms of the, the sheep and the goats and what he was supposed to leave behind. And uh, this, uh, I don't know what you call him, a shyster. I don't know if everyone's familiar with that word, but Lavan was a shyster. And he tried to trick um, Yaakov and basically keep the wealth for himself. But Yaakov was very smart and he wasn't using magic and he wasn't using DNA um, manipulation or whatever you want to call it, the GMOs, genetic, uh, genetic ma manipulation. Modified, he was yeah. using the Torah wisdom that God gave him. And that when a, a couple has relations, you know, sexual relations, intimate uh, marital relations, it's very important what you have on your mind is going to directly into the seed that is going to go into the woman. And also the woman is going to, what she's thinking about is also going to affect her seed, the ovum. And uh, there's a Gomorrah. I don't have it in front of me, but the Gomorrah is that there was a black child that was born to a Jewish couple who obviously was not that dark, and it aroused quite a few eyebrows. <laughs> you can imagine, oh, right? No. How can it be that maybe there was suspicion that somebody wasn't faithful, meaning the, the woman wasn't faithful? And uh, the rabbis uh, asked and interrogated the, the couple, and they discovered that there was a picture of a black man hanging on the wall of the woman's, of the couple's bedroom. And this had the effect on when they were having uh, the intimate relations on the fetus. Okay, this is what Yaakov used. He carved or he made some manipulative uh, carvings to show the type of patterns that that Lavan was telling him. These are the ones you can keep. So while these uh, animals were having sexual relations, that uh, they saw, they themselves saw these pictures or patterns. And they developed these patterns, and therefore Yaakov himself was able to keep these these sheep and became very very wealthy. So just keep in mind, this is one of the things we call holiness, kedusha, in 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 life is to get married and to have a loving relationship and to only think about your spouse. And okay, we're all tested. Okay, we're all tested. We're not we're not angels. But it's, um, it's very important. So just as a side note, the Ramban had written a book called Igeris HaKodesh. It's, a, it's not the famous Igeris HaKodesh that everyone thinks about, but it's talking about the um, sexual relations, what's permitted, what one should think about, how, how it should be performed. And of course, there's, um, you know, it's up to the couple, but there are guidelines that are used to enhance holy children. So uh, it is on the market. It's probably out of print in most places, but um, anyway, it's such a book that exists in English. It's called The Holy Letter. Uh, a friend of mine, I helped him actually write it, Moshe Kor. Uh, it's called The Holy Act. Okay, he translated it and uh, we translated it together. Um, you can order it through him. Uh, Dr. Moshe Kaur, K-U-H-R, you can look it up. Uh, I don't know, it was published by a place, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Haber, it was called The Lab, L-A-B. Anyway, if you look it up, it's a very, um, I don't know, necessary book for newlyweds and for anybody who wants to be holy. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to mention about race, that we really have to get beyond this. And how we're going to do that, hopefully through not just my learning, but learning from rabbis, learning from the Torah. It's, it's a real shame what's going on. So, Bezrat Hashem, we should learn and take this world to the next level. Okay. Amen. And what, okay, thank you. So, what I want to mention here, uh, I, want to I want to go through a few things. I, I left off giving over some of the commentary to a Gemara in Gemara Brachot 17a that discussed Rabbi Yochanan's 
um, when he made a siyum, when he finished the book of Job. So we, we talked about it at length last week, but I didn't finish. And I wanted to, because there's a lot to speak about, so I didn't uh, continue. I also, I'm not sure if we really finished and touched what really needed to be talked about at the end of chapter 18 in the Mesilat Yasharim, in the book, uh, The Path of the Just, or as they translate here, The Way of the Upright. But we, we're familiar with The Path of the Just, Mesilat Yasharim. So I want to do that. I also want to talk about Job in this week's Parsha. When I say this week's Parsha, I mean last week's Parsha in Israel and this coming week's Parsha in the, outside the land of Israel. I also want to talk about Tzitzit, which was at the end of this week's Parsha in Israel. And uh, it will be the end of this week's Parsha coming outside of Israel. So where do I start? That's the question. So let's start with the uh, finishing the Mesilat Yisharim. I just want to see if there's any, any uh, interesting notes yet. Nope, pretty quiet so far, Rabbi. Okay. So this would be really the finishing paragraph, or paragraphs, the last few paragraphs in um, Chapter 18. We were dealing with the trait of chasidut. So let me just sum this up a little bit. We, we spoke about the idea of going beyond the letter of the law. And a ignoramus, someone who doesn't have wisdom, can't really go beyond the letter because they don't know where the law begins and where it ends. Again, just to reiterate also, we talked about seven overreaching concepts for the Noachide, and there are many, many subcategories. So one must be, and I'm using like, I'm not here to tell you what you have to do, but I'm just telling you that if you want to be a Hasid, you have to be knowledgeable. And not only knowledgeable in what those seven overreaching concepts are, but then to be zahir, be um, careful and concerned and as strict as you can on yourself, for starters, before you can reach this level of chasidut. We're basing this on, again, the Mesil Yashari begins with zahir, to be careful in the beginning, and only in later um, he talks about chasidut. So there's, I, obviously you can count how many chapters there are, but there's we were talking about different levels, and you don't skip levels. I'm just skipping for the sake of uh, uh, being short and to the point that we want to talk about Hasidut, so I skipped to chapter 18. So the question is, where are we going to go from here? Are we going to go back and discuss all the other chapters? That's a possibility. Another idea I came up with was to go in depth in the book of Job. Job was considered a prophet for the Gentiles. So, of you know, as on the Noahide world center, how can we not understand how important this character is in the Bible? Okay, and go through it word for word like Rabbi Yochanan did with his students and made this such a statement. The statement, again, that we're talking about is pleasing or somehow sending um, satisfaction to God. And that itself, we discussed, can be very controversial because we know that God doesn't need anything. There's nothing you can do for God. So what does it mean to give nachas ruach liyotzro? Is a famous expression. If anybody's not familiar with it, I have to tell you, you have to go back and study again, okay? Because this is an important trait, and we're talking about it in terms of chasidut. The, the word chasidut is based on chesed. So we're going to see now that you're actually doing chesed to God. God doesn't need anything. Why? How can we? So let's try to try to understand that with the last few words of this chapter. So that's a good introduction. So he begins by telling us the practical definition of, of Hasidut is based on everything we spoke about. And I just want to mention now that Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler, um, this is in the Niktav Mi Eliyahu, most people are familiar. He writes, I'll just tell you, it says volume 5, page 35, that one who is not a Hasid serves Hashem from the perspective of self. I think there's a certain amount of self-absorbed personality. He wishes to perfect himself, which is not a bad thing, in the eyes of God. However, he says such service falls under the category of zahirut. That's the lower level or the beginning level, not chasidut. Now, he describes a chasid is one who serves Hashem not because he's obligated to. And this is where I think 
trying to explain this to, to non-Jews who should be aware that a, I'm not saying a vast majority, but a certain amount of the mitzvahs in the Torah are not at all obligated. Okay, they're not at all obligated to a non-Jew. And I'll just give you an idea. Things that have to do with the holidays, uh, things that have to do with, like we call chukim, mitzvahs that are not rational. Okay, so that is, in, but what about all those rational ones, right? So let's use them. Whenever it talks about a, an obligation, and the book is talking to both Jew and non-Jew. So when it's talking about an obligation to a Jew, it's talking about the rational as well as the irrational or things that have to do with holidays. Whenever it's talking about to a non-Jew, it's talking about all those rational uh, laws. Okay? Keep that in mind. So the chassid serves Hashem not because he's obligated to or because he seeks self-perfection. He does so because he loves Hashem. I mean, think about it. We, did we really discuss this idea? Is one of the seven mitzvahs to love Hashem? Well, <laughs> I discussed this idea that the Rambam clearly says, and I, I think it's, I know it's based on the, the first mission of the 11th chapter in Sanhedrin that talks about who gets a piece in the world to come. We spoke about Bilam not getting it. Every other non Jew can have an opportunity. Okay. So the idea is that if a non-Jew, a righteous Gentile, how is, he, how is he considered righteous? Because he believes that the Torah is from heaven. Now, I want to take this one step further. If he believes that the Torah is from heaven, it means that he believes every word of it, right? And if you understand clearly that the Jew has a special mission as a priest, being the, uh, the leaders, the role right. model. It's a mission, yeah. It's kind it's of so that if you believe that the Torah is from heaven and therefore the word of God, that you basically, and I'm using paraphrasing because it doesn't say it, I'm saying it, that you believe in the mission of the Jews and therefore you support that mission. If you support that mission, then you're part and parcel of this, again, we talk about being Jewish. You're being part of God's plan to improve the world, to make the world a better place. So you as a non-Jew, you have to work on yourself, it's true. And the Jew seems to have a mission that's beyond just himself. But if you're buying into the mission already, so you're going to help the Jew in every way he can, right? Perhaps even educate the Jews by saying, hey, why are you eating pork? I'm in McDonald's. I'm allowed to. But what are you doing here? There's a kosher restaurant down the street. You should be over there. Okay. You think it's not, it's, it's serious, serious stuff. I know several righteous non-Jews, B'nai Noach, who go out of their way and have relationships with non-religious Jews and try to strengthen them in their faith. They call them Jews in denial. That's, you know, they meet Jews, yeah, he's, he's in denial. He doesn't accept the fact that he has this mission. So I want to like kind of educate him a little bit to what he has to do. Let me just continue to read what the... Um, the Miktav Mi'eliyahu says, again, he does so because he loves Hashem and longs to please Him, not himself. You're doing whatever is beyond your obligation, what's beyond seven. Again, we're talking about vertically, not horizontally. To please God, not yourself. This is implicit in the root word of chasidut. The word is chesed, which means to give of oneself to others. In this case, it's talking about to Hashem with total unconcern for oneself. This is what Eliyahu Dessler, Rabbi Dessler says in Miktav Eliyahu. I think it's very important. I also want to mention something that Rabbi Chaim Kaufman, Kaufman mentioned, and I'm not arguing with him. I think that he, um, perhaps he can correct me if I'm not correct in this assumption. He mentioned about teaching and he went to a rabbi and the rabbi suggested if you don't need the money, you shouldn't go into teaching. I think that he was talking about as a parnosa, as a job, as um, a tafkid in this world, to be a teacher. I, thank God, I, I spent a long time at Eishat Torah with Rabbi Noach Weinberg, right, the author, well, he wasn't the author, but the author of the series, basically, called The 48 Ways to Wisdom. And he taught us that we as Jews have an obligation to teach all the time. So that doesn't mean that's your job 
that's your profession. Okay, we're not talking about profession. I think that Rabbi Chaim Kaufman was talking about as a profession, choosing a profession. But to say to a Jew, you're not ready yet to teach, Rav Noach Weinberg was very against that. Whatever you know, you have an obligation to teach. Go ahead. You wanted to say something? Well, Rabbi Heim Goldberg of the Noahide World Center, who I consider my rabbi, um, you know, he was a high school teacher and then a principal for 30 years. And then, you know, once that 30 year mark, hey, boom, back to Israel. He was, or, you know, Shemika, rabbi, jump right into the cause, you know, and, and be a portion of. But he did that as a livelihood for 30 years as a teacher. It was in just general education, but he, you know, with his shmiga, time to jump back into the cause and the purpose for the nation of Israel. And this is what I love. So let me just say, there's two aspects of why you have an obligation to teach. I don't mean it's a profession. So Rabbi Chaim Kaufman, again, if he was speaking about a profession, I get it. But to tell somebody you can't teach or you shouldn't teach. Now, if someone doesn't have any information at all, okay, I get it. But once you know, remember what happened in, in Russia, maybe not people are not familiar, but it was forbidden to teach Torah. And therefore they had underground groups, the Rosh the Rav Noch taught us this all the time, that people put their lives in danger just to teach one letter. If they were learning the alphabet, the alphabet, the, the Aleph Bet, and all they learned was a few letters, they had an obligation to teach their neighbors or to other people, even at the risk of their own life. So you basically knew almost nothing, and whatever piece of wisdom, of information was coming down to you, you have an obligation to teach that to somebody. What about a father? It says in the Torah, right? A father has to teach his son. So we're not talking about it as a profession. You have to teach. And if you don't have sons, we all know that students are called sons. Okay, so let me explain in two levels. I gave this idea before that when they asked the rabbis, who did you learn the most from, right? So you would think that they learn the most from their own rabbis, right? Because I'm studying and learning, I'm learning from my rabbis. But the rabbi's response was not what you, had, what you would think. They actually said, I learned more from my students, right? The actual question was posed, who do you learn more from, your, your rabbis or your colleagues or your students? And they all answered from the students. So the question is, even as not a professional teacher, you will learn more from teaching. Now, more than that, you ask anybody, we talked about this already. I don't feel like I, 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 if I think it's so important, so I will uh, repeat myself. That each one of the 613 mitzvahs has a specific sentence in the Torah that tells you it's one of the 613 mitzvahs. And if you ask anybody, where, does it, where do you know that it's so important to teach? I'm sorry, to learn Torah. Just to learn, because that's what Rav Chaim Kaufman is talking about, just learning. It's from Vishinantam Levanecha, and you shall teach. You shall teach your son. So, why? Because it's a prerequisite to, in order to teach, you have to learn. So how do we know you have to learn Torah? From the mitzvah of teaching. So teaching and learning are really, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know if parallel is the word, but... It seems like teaching is the ikker, is the prime, and learning is only a prerequisite. So the Rosh Hashiva told us that in order to learn properly, you actually have to learn with the mindset in order to give it away. And that's chasidu. That is true chesed. And therefore, you will be filled with the, the Spirit of God. Unbelievable. There's even a promise that if you teach your grandson... I think I might have mentioned this. It says that it's as if you're receiving the Torah directly from Mount Sinai. The question is, is that talking about the grandson who's learning from you? Or is that you, the teacher, giving it over to generations in advance? I think it's both. And I think it's more in the grandfather. That when the grandfather is teaching his grandson, it's as if you're receiving the Torah directly from God himself at Har Sinai. There's this channel that's opening up for continuity, right? Continuity, that, that talk, that's, and that's a, um, a code word for teaching. Now, there's all kinds of ways of teaching, not professionally. When you're sitting on the bus and if someone says, why do you guys do that? Or, you know, you're at, at, at a business meeting and someone asks, why do you guys do that? I mean, just to have an, an answer, even if you don't have it on you, say, so, you know, I'll get back to you. It's a great question. 
and then do the research, right? You have an obligation to teach. So I think that Rabbi Kaufman was speaking about professionally, and I just want to make that clear, that we all should not say, oh, when I get to this point, then I'll teach, because teaching is intrinsic in learning. Without being willing to teach, I don't think you can even possibly learn, because it's all about self-interest, and maybe that's the beginning of being Zahir, but hopefully we'll get to the point of being a Chassid, and truly have something that we think is valuable in order to give to someone else. Okay, that's a great way to start. So now he talks about, again, we're in the, um, the very last few chapters of chapter 18, uh, the last paragraphs of chapter 18 in the Seal Shishai. So he says, it thus emerges that the guiding principle of Hasidut is expanding, expanding the fulfillment of all the mitzvahs. Now when I say all the mitzvahs, I'm talking about for a Jew, all the mitzvahs are applicable to him, and for a non-Jew, all the all the mitzvahs are applicable to them, in all the appropriate and feasible scenarios and applications. And I'll read the, the comment in summary: the essence of Hasidut is bringing satisfaction to Hashem through discerning His will, God's will and striving to fulfill it in the most complete way. So that's for anybody, okay, with Jew, non-Jew. This is what we should all uh, hope for. In practice, this, this means to observe the mitzvahs in a manner that broadens their scope so that they are performed with depth and applied to every relevant aspect of one's life. So I, I really feel very good that we call this Beyond the Seven, because this is ultimately the paragraph I wanted to get to in the series, and now I'll read the footnote on that one. There are myriad applications to this principle, meaning there are many possibilities to illustrate. So there's a few illustrations here. The, the Torah prohibits, for example, a Jew from gashing himself or pulling out hair as a sign of mourning. Don't go overboard or don't do like the Gentiles do. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 14, 1. While it prohibits only these two actions, the prohibition is animated by the underlying will of God that can be applied anywhere. The prohibition reads, You are the children to Hashem your God. You shall not cut yourselves, and you shall not make a bald spot for a dead person. Now there's a lot of issues here. We're talking about pagans, how they react to death, like this is the end. We all know, and anybody, again, who believes in the, in the Bible being from heaven, actually the, actually the next piece in that Mishnah, not only does it say that who goes to heaven are those who believe that the Torah is from heaven, but those who believe in the resurrection of the dead, or let's just say for that matter, whatever comes after this life. You know, <laughs> it's so important that a non-Jew who wants to be righteous should at least study these pieces of the Torah to understand spirituality. It's not just about keeping rigorously um, seven, let's say, I don't, I don't think they're, they're dry, but just simply legalistic laws, right? There's a reason for them. We're talking about perfecting mankind and doing God's will. And with that in mind, let me continue. As Rashi explains, the Torah stresses that at least the Jewish people here are considered children of Hashem and therefore must act in a dignified manner even while grieving. The chassid, which is general, Jew and non-Jew, extend this attitude to the entire scope of this conduct and will act, dress, and speak in a manner that is befitting a child of Hashem. So I know this is heavy stuff, but we talk about you know thought, which we're going to talk about in chapter 19 if we get to it, is kavana, what you do, the behavior, how you act, and the results of your action. Okay, here, let's just finish this paragraph. He brings another example, and this I know does apply to a non-Jew. The Torah commands a person to honor his father and mother in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. This refers to honoring them through speech and action. Let me just explain. We have in, in Judaism, there's two mitzvahs. One is to honor your parents and one is to fear them. So just for practical purposes, honoring is positive mitzvahs, fear are negative mitzvahs. 
So the positive mitzvahs one has in, their, in, in honoring their parents is to feed them and to dress them and to stand up when they walk in the room. I know it sounds like fear. Um, to, to meet them at the door when they're coming in the house, right? To do active things in which you can do to honor your parents, okay? And fear of your parents means don't sit in his chair. Don't stand where he stands when he talks to, you know, he's an important person or he stands at the door and talks to guests. That's not your place, right? Don't contradict him, right? Obviously, if it's a, he's, he's uh, telling you to do something against the Torah, there's still a way with honor to teach your own father. So for us, it says, say to your father in a nice and honorable way, uh, dad, teach me this Torah again. You taught me once. Teach it to me again. So then he'll hopefully, <laughs> it'll register that he's violating that uh, per, that precept, for, for example. Um, so these are ideas in terms of positives and negatives. He goes on, he says that even though this refers to speech and action, but it doesn't address the internal attitudes one should have towards his parents. Anyone who observes the precepts of the Torah will serve and treat his parents with respect. But the Hasid goes further, right beyond the seven, beyond. He deduces that Hashem's will is that he actually develop an attitude of respect for them, that he care for them lovingly. Now, we also discussed, and I, I don't mind repeating myself because I don't expect that everyone listened to all the previous sessions, but we have two sides of the Ten Commandments. There's two tablets. One side has the five mitzvahs that are first between man and man and God, and the second set is between man and man. And yet the fifth commandment on the side, you know, the, on the side between man and God is loving your parents. And we're supposed to develop an attitude of respect and gratitude for our parents giving us physical life, even if, God forbid, they were unkind um, or abusive or brought up in a dysfunctional family, which can really, which can really send us a sideball, you know, how we're supposed to relate to Hashem. But Bezrat Hashem with enough therapy and love and, and Torah and um, growing up and maturing, we'll see beyond that. And, but in the meantime, we're talking about a relationship with God, even though the fifth commandment, loving your parents, and therefore what we spoke about up until this point is when you serve God, it's just like you would for your parents. The example I gave was if your father said to you, you know, it's really cold in this room, and so you could just give him the remote control, eh, turn up the heat, or you could turn up the heat, and you can even offer him a blanket because you know his will. You know what he wants. You want to please your father, so too we're taking this as wanting to please Hashem. Again, there is nothing you can do to please Hashem, but it's from our perspective. I spoke about this in terms of the Tanya, in terms of the uh, the book of uh, Rabbi uh, Chaim Velajim, of um, Netzach Chaim, right? These ideas are from our view. So it's not heretical, okay? <laughs> we spoke about this. It's not heretical. It's an attitude that we should have in wanting to please Hashem, which is a very difficult thing to, to understand. But let's continue now. I finished that note. Back into, we spoke about the difference between prishut. Prishut means abstinence. And he says that this is an idea of making sure you are zahir in the negative commandments. Again, that was in the beginning. While the trade of chassidut deals with the expanded fulfillment of positive commandments, which, um, uh, according to some, there are 30, some there are 60 uh, that are obligatory, maybe even more for, for B'nai Noach. And therefore, some of them are positive commandments. And um, <clears throat> I heard in the previous class also that... Um, uh, Chaim Kaufman spoke about the idea of setting up courts of judgment. If a non-Jew wants to be a judge in his court, he should, not only may he, but he certainly should learn the Hoshin Mishpat. That's one-fourth of Shochan Aruch, right? How is he supposed to judge and know the difference when, when his um, client, not client, uh, uh, the resident of his town says, I want to be judged according to Jewish law, which he has every right to say. Okay, how is he going to how is he going to judge him harshly according to Jewish law, right? If if he doesn't know it, 
So this is something that I think is uh, understood that there are so many, so we already said in the Rambam that a non-Jew can even go beyond the seven and keep kosher. As I mentioned, I'll, I'll mention it again, that there are laws of Lashon Hara, which are taking priority over eating kosher for a non-Jew. But if a non-Jew is already very careful in the way he speaks, and he decides, I don't want to eat those animals that grow at the bottom of the sea, and I don't want to eat those animals that are uh, like vultures. I want to perfect my my soul and my body, and I want to take on more things just to be a better person, right, for whatever ideas he has. Um, this is God's will that uh, human beings should perfect themselves, so why not? So he's allowed to learn the laws of kashrut, right? He's allowed to learn the parts of the Shulchan Aruch. Now, if he's already learning the Shulchan Aruch, what would prevent him then from going into the source material, right? If you have a discussion in the Shulchan Aruch where there's a Yesh Omri and there's a second opinion, well, where did that second opinion come from? Who said it? He's certainly allowed to go into the Gemara itself, as we already spoke about also. In, um, I forget right now at the top of my head, that, I mean, the Rambam mentions it in, in Hilchus Yovel, that a non-Jew, we're talking about not just a non-Jew, we're talking about a righteous non-Jew who decides to dedicate himself to Torah learning, he has the level of Kodesh Kadoshi, the Holy of Holies, of a high priest. <laughs> we spoke about that too. Yeah. So I don't want to go back too much on that. Um, let's just finish up this last piece. So he basically says <clears throat> about both Zihirut and Chasidut, they're basically the same concept, just one structurally, one is positive, one's negative. Namely, the essence of both is to add to that which was explicitly stated. It's not called adding to the Torah. It's adding respect. It's adding depth. Anything that we can determine based on the explicit command that it would be a source of satisfaction to Hashem, blessed be He. Because that's ultimately what the Hasid wants to do. And why are we talking about this? Because the Rambam mentions it, right? That he calls the person who has accepted the Jewish mission as a non-Jew who's accepted the, the, the Torah from heaven as Hasidei Umo Sa'olam. This is what prompted me to discuss this idea of Hasidut because if you're already called a Hasid, you might as well know what it means. If you want to live up to that name, this is what I'm suggesting you do, okay? Go deeper. Take on more willingness to go deeper and learn more. I... <laughs> Feel the 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 energy of the mitzvah. Not just it's a dry mitzvah. Okay, don't steal. Why shouldn't I steal? Right? And what does all that entail? There's so many things. I gave examples. You just take somebody's pen and say, ah, he doesn't care. I'll just use it and then return it to him without even mentioning a word. That's called stealing. So what's the right thing to do? And what about returning lost objects? Okay, some there's a lot of laws involved. Do I have an obligation? And if I don't return it, am I stealing? Okay, so there's a lot of ideas that people don't think about. So he just ends, this is the definition of authentic chasitut. Up until now, that's everything we spoke about. So I just want to mention at the end, he makes a summary. True chasidut, which requires a foundation of deep wisdom, is defined by a desire born of love, to bring satisfaction to Hashem. A desire to do more than simply adhere to the explicit commandments, similar to the drive that exists in any loving relationship, whether it's husband or wife. We discussed this at the very beginning. Yeah, my wife is sleeping and I have something in the room, so I want to get it. I can turn the light on and wake her up, or I can tippy-toe through the room. Now, by tippy-toeing through the room with that little bit of fear that she'll wake up is because I love her, and I don't want her to lose the sleep. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm also afraid she's going to throw a shoe at me. But um, <laughs> because I love her, and I want to please her, and I don't want to do anything that will damage her or our relationship. Let me just finish that last point similar to the drive that exists in any re any loving relationship, it means to discern in the mitzvahs what it is that Hashem really wants for us and to strive to fulfill them as well. There is one little, last little comment on this, and then we'll finish uh, this part. 
since Hasidut is the fulfillment of the mitzvahs in their broader sense, it goes without saying that first, all the actual halakhic requirements must be adhered to scrupulously. So everyone understands that before you move to the next step, get down, learn the seven in their broadest sense in terms of the halakhic requirements. Only then does the expansion of the mitzvah scope or its performance with more passion, because that's what God wants. He wants your passion, which will be discussed in the next chapter. Rav Yecheskel Sarna explained. That's a new, sorry, it's a new thing. Uh, he says this is based on Manas Chalchafai. If someone is lax in actual performance, but engages in the conduct of Hasidut, he's under that court category of pseudo Hasidus, which is not pre- is not what Hashem wants, since he shows that it's not the will of Hashem that he seeks, but only a good feeling that he himself derives from doing this pi- what he thinks is a pious act, and that is problematic. Okay. I wow. think at this point, while we're still in subject of Hasidut, we should talk about which one? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know which way to go. Um, let's talk you're, about Joe. You're, you're Joe, go, Rabbi. Joe and this week's Parsha. So when I say this week's Parsha, I'm, par- I'm talking about Parsha Shalach. And where do we find him in this week's Parsha? So when Moses is telling the spies what to look for, he gives them a whole checklist. Let me uh, open up. It's You'll find this in Numbers chapter 13. Now we're specifically going to verse 20. But before that, there's a few verses I want to look at. He said 13, verse 20. Okay. So I think... Let's say, for example, 17. Start with 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and he said to them, Ascend here in the south and climb the mountain. See the land. He gives them a checklist. How is it? And the people that dwells in it, are they strong or weak? Are there few or numerous? And how is the land in which it dwells? Is it good or is it bad? And how are the cities in which it dwells? Are they open or are they fortified? And now our verse. And how is the land? Is it fertile or lean? Are there trees in it or not? You shall strengthen yourselves and take from the fruit of the land the days where the seasons of the first ripe grapes. I only focus on these words, are there trees in it or not? The truth is, if you want to hear a whole hour and a half class, you can look on uh, the last class I gave was um, Righteous Gentiles and the Praise of the Land of Israel, but let me just try to sum it up. The Chazal is telling us, and you can see from Rashi, when, when Moses says, is there a tree in it or not, he's asking, is the protection of a righteous Gentile or Gentiles still there? Because if we're going to go into the land and there are some righteous Gentiles who are protecting the natives of the land, we don't really stand much of a chance. This is what he's saying. Now, from one of the very beginning in our series, we talked about the 45 righteous Gentiles, perhaps 30 when Israel was in Israel, 15 were outside the land. Remember we discussed that about, I hope you do, you can go back to it if you forgot it, that really I mentioned that there are righteous Gentiles, Hasidei Umas Olam, that are keeping the world going. Just like there are 36 righteous Jews that are keeping the world going, there's 45, 30 in the land of Israel that are protecting the non-Jews from harm. So even if we came into the land, right, Moses is saying, check if there's a tree. He's actually asking, is there a protector? The tree acts as a protector. In fact, we'll talk about the word silam. Silam, later on, when they said, when the spies came back, Kalev in 14.9 says their protection is removed from them. God didn't ask them, is there protection there? He, yes, he did. And when Moses said, is there a tree or not? Because the word for shade is sail. The, prote- the word for protection is silam. And the word for the image of God is selem. 
because we are a created, every human being in the image of God. What is an image? Right? I take my hand and I put it in the sun. The sun's up there. What's on the ground? Shade. Shade is sail. This is a selim. This is an image. It's not really my hand. It's just um, a hint of the hand. So too, our souls are just a hint of God. But how do they really manifest? Is it selim and lukim? This is going to this is going to be the difference between a, a righteous gentile and a non-righteous gentile. The non-righteous gentile. I don't know. You, I hope you don't stone me. Nobody's going to stone me. But, is like an animal. When the Talmud talks about non-Jews being like animals, it's talking about when they don't possess the selim and lukim. When they're not possessing these character traits that imitate God. We spoke about the whole Torah. It starts with chesed. God brings Adam, his, his wife. He clothes the naked. That's how it begins. And how does it end? God buries Moses. This is called chesed shel emes. It's the, it's the highest level of chesed because nobody's there to say thank you. Okay, it's all about chesed. If it begins with chesed, it ends with chesed. The whole idea is about chesed. We're supposed to imitate Hashem. This is what I want to get across to you guys listening to this. It's about being the Tselem Elohim. You can go from being an animal, right, to being a true, dedicated, imitated model of God. Okay, I mean, I don't know other words to say it. It's Tselem Elohim. You could be. You don't have to be. But that's your loss, and that's our loss. So we invite you to, to become a Tselem Elohim. And it's all based on Midos, which we will then get to in those commentaries on, on Job. But so I just wanted to mention this is a very important thing. If you want to see the Rashis themselves, which tells Rabbi, you, can I, can I yeah. just ask you a quick question? Because that yeah. Selim Elohim, I, I I want to do some research on that. Can you tell me how I would transliterate that into English? Selim is T Z E L E M Selim Selim Sadiq okay. Muhammad Mem. I just want to read some of these, uh, the Gomorrah in Baba Basra 15a, because the word eights, eights is not, it's 160. The Gamachi is 160. Okay. And um, the word selim is 160. When it says in, how does Job open? How does the word, how does it begin? The book of Job begins by telling us that he's a man from a place. What is the place? You'll oh. never forget it. Uts. Ayin Vav Tzadik. Okay? It's, it's basically a play on the word of eights. When Moses says, find out, this is what Rashi says. When he's, Rashi says, when Moses says, does it have trees? The word for eights is really singular. Does it have a tree? Does it have a worthy man who will protect them with his merit? That's what Rashi says. The Gemara actually says like this. That Job lived at the time of the spies. And this is proven by the fact that it's written here in Job 1.1. 1, 1, there was a man in the land of Uts. His name was Job. So here in Numbers 13.20, when Moses says whether there are trees in it or not, so the Gemara asks, what do you, what's, the, what's the comparison? One is Uts and one is Eitz. So this is what Moses said to Israel. He said this, I'm sorry, this is what Moses said to the spies, basically. Is that man whose name Job still alive and therefore living in Israel, he whose years are as long as that of a tree, and who protects his generation like a tree. So that's that part. Later on in 14.9, when, when Khaled comes back and says their protection is removed from them, he says basically their shield, this is Rashi, their shield and strength, their virtuous ones have died, namely Job, who had protected them. Then there's another interpretation, the actual protection is God himself. That's why I want to say that Selim, 
We're talking about the Tzalem Elohim, that a person, Jew or non-Jew, is able to behave through Masim Tovin, through his kind and proper acts, is bringing God into the world, is being the Tzalem Elohim that he's supposed to be, and that itself is protecting the, the people. Wow. Amazing. I just suggest to people to, to, re, to see that video on, on what I gave over in, in length, in depth and in length. And now we'll go to the comments that I began last week and cut short because I felt that they were too worthy to uh, try to summarize. And I think uh, we'll, I'm not sure where I left off, so I'm going to kind of start, I'm going to kind of start in the beginning of my comments. So first of all, Job lived to um, 140 years. He did not die early like you would have expected if he was as sinful or as bad as his friends were accusing him of that he might have died early, okay, or a painful death. But not only was everything taken away from him in, through the book, but then everything was restored and things, some things were doubled. So the idea that he was Sovea, he was, um, how does it end? He actually lived not just a good life, as, as it says, but it was, let me just use the words that the use here. Oye the Zakain Sovea Yamin. Then then Eve died, he was old and satiated with days. So the big question is how can a tzaddik ever be satiated? Because a tzaddik always feels there's more to do. How can I be resting on my laurels? I'm not perfected. I have too much work to do in this world. Guess what? Abraham, if you look in chapter Genesis chapter 25, verses I think it's verse 8, 7 or 8. It uses very similar words. You know, he died at 175, and it says in the English anyway, he died at a good old age, mature and content. This idea of mature and content in Hebrew is zakein v'soveh. He was old and satisfied. Is a very awkward word to use when we're talking about tzaddikim, and it needs to be addressed. So that's what we're going to deal with in the beginning. We're going to go into deeper ideas later on. Okay, so what is, what is an important thing to know? That uh, as Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan would say when he finished the book of Job, he would say, praiseworthy is the one who passed away with a good name. Because a good name is better than good oil. Well, when Job passed away, he passed away with a good name. So that's important. So that's just Rashi. The Maharsha explains the question that we're bothered by. He says like this, the idea of the whole concept of Safer Job is speaking about the death of a man, you know, eventual death of man, and all the pains that he has during his lifetime. That's why when Rabbi Yochanan finishes the book, he would say these words. Now, the expl exp explanation of the end of man Anybody who didn't, um, who doesn't know what we're talking about, must go back to last week's. So we're in number eight. They have to go back to number seven. So the end of man is death, and the end of an animal is slaughter. Meaning that also the end of an animal is to be slaughtered in its time. Whatever its time means, nevertheless, what was the beginning of this animal's life? The, the, the animal in the beginning was used for um, carrying loads and to do work, right? We're talking about uh, domesticated animals, let's say cow, whatever. Beast of burden. And beast of burden. So the Gemara does mention in the Bab Metzia a story about Rebbe who actually said to an animal, and it was not nice, it was not good, but he said, this is what you were created for. Well, guess what? So too man, even his end, the end of man is to die, but when that's in his old age, in its time in his old age, but all of his life, you know what his obligation is, his mission, is to be godo um amel b'torah, to grow 
and to become great in Torah. This is talking about everybody. Remember, Job is a non-Jew. He's a prophet, and he was a non-Jew. And yet, you're, you're everybody's yeah. obligation. When I, I just have to say this. For the non-Jew, it's those mitzvahs that are obligatory on them, and for the Jew, even beyond, okay, for what's obligated on them, which is more. So that's what the job of man is to go do the al Torah. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the, the, what Rabbi Yochanan said was everything for death, they are standing. So in Hebrew, you have to uh, tune your ears. Hakol lemita heimom din. This is going to become very important in later commentaries like the Tzlach and some Kabbalistic ideas we're going to get into. Because also before its time, in other words, man is standing to die before his time as well, meaning the end of man will be either according to his sin, if he sins, and an animal according to um, what we call mikra, and randomness. So this is something that the book of Job goes through, the providence of God versus the mazalot, versus constellations. When we call a non-Jew who's not yet adopted the seven Noachai laws, and maybe he's a pagan, we call him a akum. Akum means oivde, he's serving uh, mazalos, the chochavim, chochavim is mazalot, he's the constellations. He's basically, he's not believing in the providence of God, but some other forces. Okay, I'm going to leave that quite vague for the moment. Also, the idea is, Job deals with reward and punishment. It deals, again, with the idea of fate versus free will. There's so many topics that Job will deal with. Uh, uh, basically, why do good people suffer? Why do people who are not good uh, prosper, right? So basically, that's the same thing. Okay. Um, so the reason is that the end of man is according to his sin, as we said, or uh, animals according to fate. Therefore, Praiseworthy is the man who's what? These are the important words. Drum roll, please. Shiase mitzvos umasim tovim. Who does kind acts, who does mitzvot and masim tovim, kind acts. And then he's putter, he's, I'm sorry, nifter. He, when he passes on, he at least dies with a good name from the, when he passes on from this world, he dies with a good name. Okay. Now the tzlach is a little bit more Kabbalistic, but We'll deal with it. He explains also when the Sefer, when the book of Job was finished, so it says that Job, when Job finished, when the end, we just read the last verse, that he was survey yamin. He was somehow satisfied in his, his days. So lachora, it seems, how can we ever use those terms when we talk about tzaddiki? Why? Because we know in Perkei Avot, it says, Greater is one moment in this world doing good acts right. than all of the world, all of the life in the world to come. There's nothing you can do to advance your level. That's it. Once you die, this is big. all we have is this world in order to do mitzvahs and kind acts. Now, once a person passes on, he is considered choshi min ha-mitzvot. He's free. He's, he's exempt from any mitzvot. So, Big change. Basically, he basically is quoting a Jerusalem Talmud that says, and from that point onward, there's no ability for man to perfect himself. There's no ability. Remember, the mitzvahs are basically tikkun amidos. They actually fix you Listen, we don't always understand why each mitzvah is, but it's to, put, it's to make us more sensitive and God conscious. Okay, that's for sure. Okay, so there's no more ability to do any of that, which is not the case while he's still alive. While the tzaddik's still alive, he's going to add to his perfection each and every day. He's going to go up level by level. And if that's the case, how is it possible to use these words by, by a tzaddik that he is Soveya Biyamin, and again, it strengthens the question because Abraham, we know, is a tzaddik, and the same words, similar words, are used when he passes away as well. So, this is the beginning of the answer. It's clear 
in the words of the Gemara, where Rabbi Yochanan finishes this, the book of Job, that um, he writes about him, right? The book itself writes that he was Sovei Yamim. So the, the question, again, just reiterated is, how, is, how can you relate to a, a righteous person ever being satisfied in his days? So it's clear when it says the end, when Rabbi Yochanan says the end of man is to die, meaning to say that his end or his tachlito, his purpose, the goal is just like the end of an animal who's supposed to be slaughtered. Now, what does that mean? That, okay, this is going to get really freaky. Let me just explain about the four levels of existence. You have what we call domain, uh, inanimate mineral world. And then you have tzameach, which is plant life that comes from the minerals, grows forth from the minerals. And then above that you have chaya, you have animal life, which exists on eating uh, the grass and the, the whatever grows, the herbage. And then you have man, which is one step above and eats or consumes and survives on the lower three worlds. Okay, so just like eventually the animal will have a tikkun, will find its let's say, brought up to the next level, it's fixing, is through the blessing, the blessing that the righteous person is going to make when he consumes, or at least let's just figure when he makes the, when a man, when a Jew slaughters an animal, there's a bracha to be made, he's making a blessing when he slaughters the animal, that already is helping the tikkun for the animal. So he's raising the entire world. He's raising from the mineral that was then brought into the, grasses or the herbage which was then brought into the mouth and digestive system of the animal which is then being brought up to the highest level of man through eventually eating or consuming this animal so if, he, if he didn't slaughter the animal in other words if it was novella it was just you know a roadkill or just died on its own so then it's called um, total loss I gotta start all over again it didn't get that blessing on the rabbi who slaughtered it or the person who slaughtered it or the Jew that was able to eat it, or even for that case, and just keep this in mind, even a non-Jew, you, 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 you take an animal and you slaughter it, however you slaughter it, then you, you're going to consume it. It wasn't Nevela. So then, um, so perhaps for you, it's exactly the same thing. We're bringing up to the next level uh, that part of the world. Okay. If that's the case, the same thing applies by man, that his end is going to be good when he completes himself through his actions. This is talking about mankind in general, not just the Jew. The end was Shumto Ellis, because at this point, right, after he dies, he has no more possibility of increasing anything. It's only while he's alive. So um, so then, as Takutuhi, I'm... Hamita, so therefore his end, the goal of his end is eventually to die, where his soul will then go up to the highest level. And non-Jews, this is what it says in our Holy Torah, right? When I say Holy Torah, I'm talking about the, the oral Torah as well. And you want to know where exactly? You can look in the uh, the um, first mission of the 11th chapter of St. Hedrin, Chelek, which says that every Jew is a portion of the world to come. And through this discussion of the Gemara, and it's clear, Bilam had been mentioned, does not get a portion, that obviously righteous non-Jews do, okay? So, so just, I, I happen to think this is where the Rabbah got his idea that um, who can, who's considered a chassid, who goes to the world to come, those non-Jews that buy into um, the Torahs from heaven, and there is such a thing as resurrection of the dead. Okay, that's for another class if you want. Um, anyway, so that, yeah. So what happens at the end of a person's life? I mentioned from the very beginning in our first class, every Jew, every non-Jew, every human being has a Yetzirah. The purpose of life is to have a war, a jihad, an inner jihad, right? We against the Yetzirah. So God, Nifter Bezeh, Milchama to Yetzirah. When he finally perfects his soul as much as he can, then he is exempt, he, is, uh, he passes on. And he's no longer fighting with his Yetzirah. Finished. Okay.
Now, let me just get a, a sip of water here. Wonderful stuff, Rabbi. Wonderful. Now, we continued. Remember, the, 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 the Rabbi Yochanan continued, and he said everything. After he said about man's end is to die, and the end of an animal is to be slaughtered, then he says, All for death they are standing. But again, I want you to tune your ear to the words. All for death are standing. What does it mean to stand? So this is interesting. According to the way that Slach uh, explains it, that uh, some people came to um, comfort, comfort um, the family of Rebbe Boone because he died short. He only lived, well, let's say he only studied Torah for 28 years. I don't know if he was 28 years old when he died, but he, um, he definitely died young. So they said that Rebbe, the Rebbe Boone reached the 28th year of learning Torah what he was able to reach in 28 years, somebody who studied their whole life, 100 years couldn't even reach, okay? So basically, the question would be, we don't understand. So if he learned so much in 20 years, why wouldn't, why are we comforting through that? Let him, he could have lived more and imagine what he could have learned if he learned, if he lived 29, 35, 40, 60, 80, Imagine if he would live 100 years. If he was able to accomplish in 28 years, imagine what he could have learned, what he could have accomplished every day that he lived afterwards. How is that a consolation? First of all, I do want to mention the number 28 is koach. Koach means potential. So he reached his koach. He reached his potential. But that's a side point. That's my commentary. We'll put it in the in the Talmud at some other date. Anyway. <laughs> So that was the question. Why couldn't he have lived longer? How is that a consolation to anything? And then it comes out basically that we really lost him because he only lived a short period of time. So Rabbeinu Shmuel Saba answers like this. Now this is really deep. That certainly every man, Shalakol Seichel Enoshi, every person has a certain amount of intelligence. But there's a limit for each person, whatever he's able to accomplish, and he's not able to accomplish anything more than that, according to this opinion. So basically, Rebbe Boone reached that in that 28 years. He reached all he could and therefore was not able to reach anything more than that. If that's the case, then it wouldn't have helped him to live another day or years or whatever. And this is what it means now when we read the words that Rabbi Yochanan said that everyone is destined to die, and that's what they're standing. That's what they're standing for. Hakol Amita, everyone's going to die. That's what they're standing. Means like this. The intent is of this answer is that we still said if he would have lived more, he could have reached further. No, that everyone is for Misa. That everything is for Misa. That's what they're standing for. Now, what are angels? Angels. Angels are omdim. Look in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. It's talking about the seraphim were standing above at his service. That's angels are omdim. Angels never go up or down in terms of their own level. They don't ascend or descend in terms of their own level. Okay? They exactly the way God made them. And um, I think this is just because we were talking about this before, about the Satan. In Judaism, Satan is not a fallen angel that um, doesn't do God's will. He does exactly what he's told. And that we can learn in Book of Job. But anyway, Seraphim, the angels are standing. But what about man? Man is not standing. And this brings us back to the original question. How can we speak about a tzaddik being um, soveya the Yamin, how can he be satisfied? So we look in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 7. Righteous people are called Holchim. Righteous people are, I don't know how to translate this good other than walkers, but they're not just walkers as opposed to standing. They're traveling. They're on a journey. 
And this is what I love about these, these Noachites that I meet. Everyone is on an individual journey. You cannot, I mean, you can compare whatever you're going through with other people, and you should find fellowship with other people, but your journey is unique to you, okay? And um, you're exactly where you're supposed to be, hopefully on this journey, mo mo moving. Holchim is moving. So it says in Zechariah, Thus said Hashem, Master of Legions, if you go in my ways, right? He's talking about tzaddikim. You're going to walk in my ways. Then I will grant you strides. Strides are large steps among the angels that stand here. So if you get the difference between a tzaddik is someone who's on a journey who's moving and the angels are standing, not moving per se. So now we understand. Because of this, basically the angels remain in their level, wherever they are, the whole time they're created. They're never going up or down in terms of their own levels. But at Sadiq, each and every day, through his Masim Tovim, the Oisik Patorah, through his kind acts or doing mitzvahs and his involvement in Torah, he's able to reach his own perfection more and more every single day. So then he's going and ascending from one level to another all days of his life. Um, but we did see in the Jerusalem Talmud that mentioned that each person has their their limit. They can't go beyond their limit, right? So that was that was a problem. Yeah. So there is a possibility for tzaddikim to actually reach that level of the angels. Whoa. In other words, that's what it's talking about. Everyone is right. Everyone is destined to be omdim, even those tzaddikim eventually to reach the level of angels. Unbelievable! Wow. I have jaw dropping. The Yeshnam Tzadikim Shemagim LeMadregat Malachim Shehem Omdim. There is this possibility for a tzaddik to reach the level of an angel who's just standing there. Ki agiu lesof malashlemos haodam because he finally reached that gvul, that limit, and that as far as that man can go, can only for him can only reach the level of angels. There's no space to go further. Therefore, the only goal for them is to die. That through Misa, that through that death, that person will release or undress himself from his physical body and become pure in spirit and extremely holy. Just like the animal that reaches his perfection through being slaughtered and eaten through the mouth. Imagine a tzaddik sitting here on TV, on video, or sitting live in a Beit Midrash. He's moving his mouth. He's talking Torah. How did he get that energy? Because he had meat. So the, 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 the purpose of that animal was to be eaten, to be slaughtered, and then eaten through the mouth of the tzaddik. So too a person reaches his, his goal through death then his spirit returns back to God and he then will benefit or receive the pleasure from the shine, the ziva shina, that total communion and unification with the creator of the universe, which is pure light and energy. And that's where he goes in the end. Okay, you understand why I didn't want to end last week's class going through that this is, this is such oh, a juicy... Oh, this is immense, yeah. Beautiful stuff. Um... I want to skip one thing. Maybe we'll get back to it. Maybe. Uh, maybe I'll, you know what? I won't skip anything. Okay. So the Re'if explains that the dimoy, meaning the similarity of this verse, of the statement that was made by Rabbi Yochanan, that the end of man is to die and the end of an animal is to be slaughtered. What is the similarity? Why are we comparing this to the book of Job or to Job himself? That so too, just like an animal, they don't have a need to be considered fat before you slaughter it. So you have, a, you have an animal and you know it's going to be slaughtered in three months. So today you're not so concerned the fact that he's thin. But, however, as a person who works with animals, you know that before you slaughter him, 
you want to feed them as much as possible because you want that meat. But right now, it could be a year away, so you don't care that he's not fat. But before the slaughtering, um, but okay, let me just read my like, just like by an animal, we're not really needing that he becomes fat except before he's slaughtered. That we're not caring right now at all. It right before if um, that he's thin. Okay, so to a man, even though he might be um, experiencing a lot of troubles and problems, hardships, like Job did in his life, the prime thing is really what's going to be said about him. What's going to be what's going to happen at the end of his life? Will he have shalva and sheket? Will he have peace and quiet at the end? Because it's the end of man at the time that he dies. So too we find by Job, even though that he experienced these hardships his whole life, right? That lo nizkara tors rishonim shalo kemen shibasov. See, at the end, it's almost like it never even happened, right? We don't mention the original hardships that he experienced at the end of his life because he lived a life, so they, uh, was, right? He was old and satisfied. That's how it ends. We're not mentioning, oh, he had such a troubled life. No. And this is what it means. Hakol misa heimomdim. All for death, they're standing, meaning just as someone who has an animal. Right? He has an animal, and he's concerned the whole time that it should be fat and fit for slaughter. So, too, a man needs to strengthen himself the whole time with midot and masim tovim. I just want to explain another word, dimyon and midot. Dimyon, um, we're actually, it's also similar to be created in the image of God, similar to God. Then midot are character. So, another, it's a, just a reverse of letters. But it's the same idea that we have to similarly uh, characterize God in our own lives. It's actually the same word. Midot are the words we're talking about for character traits. And dimyon is, means similar to God. Okay, anyway. So the whole time we're working on our, we have to strengthen ourselves in character and in good acts. Because everything is standing, everything for death is they're standing. So he says like this. We don't know. Like it says in, in um, Perkei Avot, you're supposed to do repentance the day before you die. And since you don't know when that is, it has to be every day. So too, we're not going to wait. See, when you're slaughtering an animal, you know. So it's going to be a year you're going to slaughter him. So you don't care that he's not fed, you know, an extra extra meals right now. But when it comes to us, we don't know when we're going to die. We have to work on our character and our Maisim Tovim every day as if it's the last day. Okay, in order that we should end up hopefully fulfilling the idea of dying eventually, 120 years from now, with a good name. That uh, ends with that whole book of Job. Okay, this is, I think, the best part. Okay, maybe we already explained some of it outside, but uh, there's a Pirusha Ketuv that explains, and the Pirion explains that. Rabbi Yochanan wanted to remove from the hearts of those that would make a mistake by saying, like, what would people say? And I think people do say this, that there's no difference between man and animal. Why are, uh, let me just use the phrase here, Adam Garua Mina Bahama. That man is actually worse than an animal. And I've heard people say this. And you know what? When you're not living with God, you're not living with the seven laws, I think they're 100% right. That uh, man is worse than an animal. But for those that don't get it, so let's say they consider this idea that man is worse than an animal. Why? What happens to animals when they die? They at least get put on the table of a human being. What happens when a man dies? He goes into the grave and he's he's rotten, right? It rots and, the, and what do they call the worms and all these, I don't know, these... Uh, the, the insects, I mean, just think about it. If you're just thinking from that point of view, at least an animal is going to be elevated, dot, 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 and useful. Like, it's not a total loss. What happens to man? I mean, today, cremation is quite popular, but let's say just to be buried in the ground and to be uh, disintegrated by the forces of nature. So perhaps that's what a person would say. 
Uh, let me just, it's right. Okay, that's pretty good. I, I pretty much said that. Okay. And this is why Rav Yochanan is saying what he says when he finishes the book of Job that teach us about that the God's providence is on everything, whether it's reward and punishment or what happens to the soul after death. So too, what happens to a behema, an animal, after, um, after it dies? So to a man, guess what? There is something that happens to a man after he dies. The alias neshama, the soul goes up. And this is similar, she says, taloi, this is dependent on what a man does. It's all going to be dependent on what a man does. He has to be, and this is the words that Rav Yochanan used, gadol b'torah v'amalo b'torah v'oisei nachas ruach l'rot yotro. That he is either great in Torah or increases in Torah, or and he toils in Torah and he makes a satisfaction to his creator, then and only then will he have alias neshama. Only then will his soul go up uh, to a higher level after he dies. Now the Leib Eliyahu explains that every man, sh- okay, I'm talking to everybody listening, not just the every Jews. Man. Every man. Shekol adam tzarik l'shol atzmo. Every person must ask. When I say man, I hope all the women understand. I mean mankind. That every human being must ask themselves. Ech yatachin adam Garua mibehema. How is it possible that a man is worse than an animal? Everyone's going to ask themselves. Shereya behema lacha motzu yesh mimenu toelis ben masha oichlim es basaro. That we all know that the animal, after he dies, people are going to eat it. There's a great advantage. The men, people are going to eat the, the meat. Avadam ma toelis yesh mimenu lacha motzu. Every human being must ask this question. What benefit is there for man? And from here we can prove, you know what? That there actually is another world after this. There's a world of souls. That's the true life. That's the true world of life. That's where living really takes place. But keep this in mind. Olam Tzarich Ella kedei lezachut laoto olam. In order to merit this world that we're talking about, the world to come, Adam tzarich Adam sheyeh gadol b'Torah. A person has to become great in Torah. This is not reserved just for the Jew. We read this before in the list of thirty things that the the non-Jews accepted upon themselves. This is in Gemara in Chulin ninety two a. The positive commandment to engage in the study of those parts of the Torah that are relevant to Noahides. This is just one of those positive commandments that Noahides accepted upon themselves. So don't tell me you can't learn Torah. The question is which part, and don't get upset if you can't learn those things are not relevant, because you have to study that's what's re- what is relevant to you. Rabbi, can I just ask you to define the term great? I mean, somebody who's got to be great in Torah, I mean, is that just, you know, achieving your potential or is this, you know, excelling that potential? I want to skip the question for now because I'm going to refer to it in about three minutes, okay? So if I forget, remind me because there's a piece here. No, you're ahead of me in your notes and you can just see how it provokes in the student thing. Okay. So he says, "As gam ye niftar b'shem tov, only through again through becoming great and toiling in Torah, he will end up having a shem tov. Shem tov means a good name. V'lo yomer alav, and then people won't say about him what benefit is there to man. In other words, what what were we discussing? This whole idea that people will think that animals have it much better. Or there's a purpose at least. It's not a total loss. Look at man." No, when you die, when someone dies with a shame tov, the people who are remaining will say, look at what he did for the world. Look at the, um, the things that he added, the love, the concern for the poor, or he put his name on, I don't know, one thing that he really liked, and people remember him for that, right? Something to improve the world. He leaves behind a shame tov, and that shame tov, is where people will always remember the answer to this important question. 
what benefit is there to man over animal? Animals at least go on the table. Man goes and rots in the ground. No. Ki adam ze yiska lechiyot ba'olam and neshamot. This man will merit to live in the eternal world of souls, which is the purpose of creation. Okay. So I want to skip to this one part that asked the question, what does it mean when we said that great or praiseworthy fortune is the man who is gadol b'torah v'amel b'torah, great in Torah and um, toiling in Torah. I, I will kind of shorten it up a little bit. So the word gadol, great, could have two meanings. One is that you yourself, people recognize that he is great in Torah. He has amassed a certain amount of knowledge and is a teacher. Or we're talking about just growing. In other words, it means to constantly be in a stage of growth. Not that you have accomplished, but that you're in the process of constantly uh, making it real, making the Torah that you learn uh, real to you and moving on. The problem he wants to mention is what about those people that are great already in Torah? So that's where this other idea comes in, that you're constantly growing. Even if you're great, you'll never give up learning. Imagine, you know, I guess it's called resting on your laurels. Someone who has really, you know, got, you know, a certain smicha, a certain level of proficiency, and then he, I don't know, goes on vacation for the rest of his life. I don't know. I mean, what's the point of that? But if someone is has actually reached that point and continues to learn, that's that's greatness. And I, I, I want to read the word. I want to read the words because it makes more sense when someone else says it. Um, so there's two ideas. Uh, the base Yosef explains um, from based on a safer called Bina Li Team. Uh, praiseworthy is he, even if he's already great in Torah, meaning the Torah has brought him to greatness. Now he has a title rabbi. Now he has a title of teacher. Nevertheless, he doesn't stop from learning. He doesn't um, say, I have already reached all that I can, but rather he still is Isaac. He still is involved and toiling in Torah. Whereas the eighth Yosef, Explains when it says Shagada Batora, it means that he is Shagidulo Hayabidarcha Shal Torah, that he's growing in the way of Torah. Just like it says in Mishnah Avos. So I have to <clears throat> look it up exactly, but it's in chapter six, Mishnah four. This is the way of Torah. We okay, so those that are familiar that with uh, bread dipped in salt you eat and w water in measure you drink and on the ground you will sleep and with lots of pains you will live your life. So even though he is, what's the word, um, toiling in Torah, meaning that he's continuing his learning and the Torah he is making, a, he's toiling, he's working hard. That's what it means to grow or greatness in Torah. And the Evan Shlomo says, who is praiseworthy? Praiseworthy is the one who's God of Torah. What does that mean? That he's also toiling in this world for the sake of Parnassa. This is what Rabbi Kaufman mentioned. So he's working for a living, but it's only the reason he's working every moment that he spends at work is only so that he could involve himself in Torah. Okay, so there are people that have to work. It's a four it's a four letter word we don't mention in my home. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Rabbi <laughs> Rabbi, I heard during um in upstate New York here, during the depression, there was a rabbi that uh, was in charge of a good sized synagogue and the depression was so bad everybody was out of work. And he went, walked five miles out of town or 15 miles out of town to, to work at a, a, a tomato farm. And he only did it so he could bring back tomatoes 
for the synagogue, the people of the synagogue, so that they could eat. And they were hungry, and he did that, and he toiled. And it was all about what you're just saying, that toil for Torah, and he would work in the field. And, you know, he carried this on for, for years and years and years until con- he was getting older. Congregation pe- had to apparently pull him back and give him a great... And I think what you're touching on, I think in the 48 ways you and I had mentioned before this class today, isn't that where the crown comes, you know, where, where, you know, like I understand if somebody's a musician, but if they're crowned a musician, everybody notices it. Everybody recognizes it. There's something to be said about somebody who's just, wow, got that extra. I I don't know if we could ever attain that, but (laughs) you're saying it's there. If we just spend our time and work. It's always always good to do a, a job that you enjoy and you fulfill, fulfill. And if it's making the world a better place, like being a scientist or a doctor or you know, even a lawyer, def- being defense lawyer or prosecuting criminals, whatever it is, or being a cop, <laughs> whatever it is that you feel you're making a, a, an, an impression, a long a lasting impression to make the world a better place, that's great. Sometimes it's not. So you can meditate while you're doing the work that you're doing this so that you can learn Torah and you can make the world a better place by learning Torah on your off time of work. Okay, I just want to finish one more idea, and that is in Parsha Tzitzit. So I mentioned I would mention I mentioned earlier that I would I would bring it up that when um, this idea of learning, or let's say like this, the idea of performing, doing masim tovim before you can be holy, before you can be this chassid. So if you look in chapter sixteen, no, I'm sorry, it's chapter fifteen of Numbers. So that you remember and perform all my commandments and be holy to your God. So the idea is Lamantis Guru Vasitam, do it, doing the mitzvahs. What verse? And then by, huh? Numbers 15, what verse? Okay, I'm sorry. It's uh, ch- number 40. It's chapter 15, verse 40. But you have to say it in Hebrew, but we'll read the English. So you shall remember and perform the word perform. The action, vasitam, so doing, masim tovim, doing actions, being involved in masim tovim is vasitam, doing all my mitzvahs, and only then vayitam, only then will you be kadoshim lelokechem, only then will you be holy to your God. Now, that's nice that God said that to us, but what about him? We've been talking all along that we're an image of God, silem, selem, dimyon, Guess what? Look at the next. I am Hashem, your God, who's taken you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Hashem, your God. So, too, he acts. He took us out of Egypt first. Lihiyot. See the same idea? To be. To be. Only after he acts. Again, chesed. So when we think about the chesed, we have to have such gratitude and want to please Hashem because he doesn't owe us anything. We we can never pay him what we owe him, but we can at least try, right? Again, not that we could ever do it, uh, but it's the imagination. How much gratitude, that's what a Jew is, so full of gratitude, okay? How could we ever repay Hashem for all the chesed he ever did for us from the time we were in the womb until the moment we came out? And the entire, however many years we've lived, the chesed, the kindness that he's shown us, how could we ever pay him back? But we can try. We can at least start with an attitude of gratitude and do what we are supposed to do minimally, minimally, and hopefully bring on this idea of chasidut, of trying to satisfy the will of our creator. So that, with that, I think that ends part eight. Wow, that Rabbi, that is so touching there in the end, and so real and so true. And um, I just want to thank you, and you know, give a shout out to a, a friend of mine down there in California who goes by the handle G A L. She made a, a statement earlier. I just wanted you to know. She says she so appreciates Rabbi Poston's crystal clear clarity of examples of what it looks like and what it does not look like. And I want to thank you. Um, what a touching uh, uh, end to that lesson. And um, we know you've got ideas rolling around in your your mind for even more you want to share. And I look forward 
to whether you want to share more. Maybe you're talking about possibly adding in some of the book of Job now, possibly the 48 yeah. ways. This is some exciting stuff so, that I think yeah. all B'nai so Dog need we, to we have three choices. I mean, we probably have more, four or five, but and maybe we'll do the six constant mitzvahs next because that's shorter. Then maybe we'll do the 48 ways to wisdom. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful. We stuff. can't forget to continue somehow in this. So I don't know how that we're going to fit in. And um, such I a small Rabbi book, Freidowitz. but hard to die. Thoughts there. He, he did a he did a series on Job, so it could be maybe I'll just upload them. I, I have to find something good because this is just an unbelievable subject to talk to Bnei Noach about. Oh well, thank you so much for sharing, and I just. Uh, Pray Hashem takes it like uh, living seeds in the wind and that it fertilize everywhere. And uh, B'nai Noach uh, say, hey, hey, here's a good message. Catch this. There's something great in here. You're going to learn, Tori. You're going to draw closer to Hashem. And I hope it goes in that direction. So, Rabbi, are we are we good for next week? Are we uh, tentative? Hashem willing? All Everything goes okay? And uh, riots don't break out everywhere? I mean... And down in Seattle, just not too far from me, they've taken over part of the city and stuff. But uh, no, I'm way up in the Rockies, out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, so Hashem willing, I should be available. Are you available next week? We're going to aim for it, sir. It's right, Hashem. We're on for next week. Oh, man. I mean, well, thank you, Rabbi. So, folks, thanks for joining. Feel free to always uh, uh, catch him on uh, his, his website. You can find him on yubinay.com. Uh, he's had some powerful messages there. You can find him on Facebook. You can find him on YouTube. Feel free to put down some questions for, uh, um, Rabbi Poston. I think you'll find he will work them in or he'll, uh, uh, address them directly to you. He cares. And it's always beautiful to hear Torah coming out of Jerusalem to the rest of the world. It means so much to me, uh, to hear it. And I hope it does to you as well. So till next week, folks, have a wonderful wonderful week.